200 years ago yesterday, the President of the United States, James Madison, signed a resolution admitting Indiana as the 19th state of the United States. The new state was sparsely populated and still a frontier and quickly earned its nickname as the Crossroads of America, not in those days because of interstates, but because of canals that were trying to traverse the state at that point. And much like neighboring states before it and many after it, Indiana began as a largely agricultural state, but it really took off with the arrival of the Industrial Revolution and developed into a strong manufacturing hub. And in fact, as all of you know, Indiana remains the most manufacturing intensive state in the United States today. Now, that manufacturing has changed a lot in 200 years or 175 years. And in fact, present day Indiana has grown into home base, not only for growing information technology companies and marketplace, but also for a whole range of advanced industries across legacy sectors of industry that are exciting and have 21st century possibilities all across the board. Companies like Eli Lilly and Roche and Dow and Cummins, but also companies like Rolls-Royce and Allison uh, and Salesforce, and a number of many smaller companies that are growing up in the new entrepreneurial wave across the state. This was a state that was really driven by entrepreneurs from the beginning, and they are alive and well. At the same time, the state has been very thoughtful and very attentive to growing a tremendous higher education system. This is home to some of the nation's finest colleges and universities. We have someone with us today who can speak to one of those. Um, and we're also, interestingly, for being a small state, we seem to keep intersecting with national politics. So in January, we will send our sixth elected vice president of the United States, Mike Pence, to Washington, D.C. That's in January. Today, as we are celebrating our bicentennial, we are really honored to have three distinguished public servants with us who have many years combined in serving the state. But if you ask anybody out there who are the three thought leaders on politics, on policy, on the future that you would like to hear from about Indiana, these are, these are the three. These are the three that we all would like to hear from and will hear from. So let me introduce them. In the middle is Evan Bayh, who has been a U.S. Senator from 1999 to 2011. From 1989 to 1997, he served as Indiana's 46th governor. As governor, he presided over a state that succeeded in diversifying its traditional manufacturing base, adding aerospace and defense assets, extending our automotive capabilities to include major Japanese companies as well as traditional American ones, and he practiced fiscal, dis fiscal discipline and sensible government that kept Indiana in great shape going into the new millennium. He's currently a partner at McGuire Woods and a senior advisor at Apollo Global Management in New York. Mitch Daniels was sworn in as the 49th governor of Indiana in 2005 and served two distinguished terms as an effective leader who also sought to take the state in bold new directions including his major moves program for expanding our highway infrastructure, the development and streamlining of the Indiana Economic Development Corporation to consolidate and accelerate the state's growth. He is currently the president of Purdue University. And then Randall Shepard was appointed to the Indiana Supreme Court in 1985. He became Chief Justice in 1987, retired from the court in 2012, at which point he was the longest serving Chief Justice in Indiana's history and the longest serving leader of a state high court in the nation. During his tenure, Justice Shepard upped the bar for judicial service, and the court under his leadership was widely and correctly viewed as the preeminent source of high integrity, first tier, and pragmatic legal decision making at the state level. So, with, those, with, with the talent we have assembled here today, we're about to have a great conversation. And uh, Randy has brought this group together and has volunteered to moderate a uh, panel, such as it needs moderation. Uh, and I think, Randy, I'm going to turn this over to you. I believe everybody may have some initial comments that you all want to make. Uh, and then you have some questions uh, for them. And then you will have some questions for them, which I will get and bring up to Justice Shepard. So this should be fun. Randy, I'm going to have you. you take it away. Thank you. Uh, David has reminded me that I've wanted to get on the public record for a long time. One of the cleverest lines uh, ever invented, uh, 
uh, Justice Mark Massa while he was working for uh, Mitch Daniels. Um, when he learned of uh, the nomination of Dan Quayle, he repeated it this year, said, the mother of vice presidents is pregnant again. Oh. <laughs> and uh, turned, turned out to be uh, right. I don't know whether we're number one or number two. We got it close to the top. Well, um, thanks for this chance to, uh, to share with you as the, uh, uh, as the uh, uh, publicity says, uh, we're gonna look backwards and look forward. We're really only gonna passingly look backwards, but I've asked my friends uh, to uh, think about one question that has to do with our history that might reflect on our present. Um, and uh, I, have, I have an answer or two of my own, but uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start by, uh, I'll ask for <coughs> Mitch to go first. I, uh, the, the, the question was, uh, what is a person or event or decision in our past that's made tremendous difference in our present and future? So Randy said that the really intimidating thing when he walked up here, he said, there's an obvious answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. Right? Yeah. So in, I'm, in my customary roles, Mr. Obvious, let me see if, let me see if I've got the one you were thinking of. And it's a really interesting question. And I flipped back through uh, 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 Professor James Madison, our premier uh, historian on Indiana, his latest update called Hoosiers. If you haven't read it, you should. And um, uh, to me, uh, the, the obvious answer is the Internal Improvements Act of 1836, which was a very ambitious, audacious, as we say these days, uh, undertaking. They borrowed the, at that time, staggering sum of something like $10 million. They were going to build canals. Internal improvements were the uh, um, part of the uh, American system of Henry Clay. and, the, uh, and um, Abe Lincoln was big on internal improvements, so Indiana took a big chance, and <clears throat> it blew up in their face. Almost none of, well, none of the big projects was ever finished. You can still ride a few miles of the Whitewater Canal and places like that, but people uh, uh, broke down uh, trying to complete. But the reason I pick it is that it, uh, it led to two things that I think have stayed with us ever since. One was a new constitution. This was such a fiscally devastating, the state defaulted on all these bonds. Uh, we were uh, subject of derision and, uh, and animosity all the way to London and places where people had bought these bonds, thought they'd been stolen from and so forth. <clears throat> and so we got a new state constitution which has some good things in it and maybe some not so good, but anyway, we're still living with that constitution today. And it has defects in it, I bet Evan and I agree on this one for sure. It's one of the few constitutions where the governor doesn't uh, veto can be overridden without a supermajority. A terrible thing we should fix it some <laughs> In any event... We are starting off with a bipartisan agreement. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it, we got a new constitution for better or for worse, has proscriptions against going into debt, which is uh, a good thing in my opinion. But uh, the other thing it did, maybe of, of even greater impact, I think it led to an innate caution about bold endeavors that ran all the way through most of our history. It was 170 years, and I can't think of an exception in between, between that and the major moves program of 2006, which was the biggest infrastructure program in the country then or since, I mean, relative to the size of the state. And, um, but a lot of time was lost in between. Well, well Hoosiers of both parties and all persuasions were very, very cautious about change. If, let somebody else try it first. Um, uh, if it's not broke, even if it is, <laughs> be careful fixing it. And uh, so I hope that, that uh, we're, we're outgrowing that now. But uh, I always said I was a Whig. You know, I really believe in internal improvements and those sorts of things. But uh, um, it, uh, it took us a long time to get over that one. You got a different one? Are you going to... Well, actually, I was, that was on my list, too. Uh, I think Mitch is uh, exactly right. That was one of the things, one of the experiences that has uh, marked our state as a more fiscally conservative uh, place. 
As a matter of fact, I think it was a constitutional amendment that was passed in, I think, 1988, when I was first running for governor, that for the first time, we were one of only two states that uh, was we couldn't invest in equities for in our state pension funds. Yeah. And so the rate of return in our pension funds was lagging the other states, because over long periods of time, although they're more volatile, equities tend to you know, perform better than bonds. And so that was one of the legacies of that constitution that carried on. I couldn't help but uh, think of something, Mitch, while you were speaking about the, that Constitution. Ron, Roger Brannigan, one of our uh, predecessors as governor, had a uh, puckish sense of humor. And in that Constitution, it provided that the legislature only met every other year for 60 days. The you know, odd number of year, they just would, or the even number of year, they just wouldn't meet. And his comment was that the Constitution had it all wrong. They should meet every 60 years for two days. <laughs> but that's coming from a governor where you tend to have institutional view of uh, your responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the legislature. So, uh, but that was on my list, Randy. I I'd mention just two others uh, quickly. And by the way, David, thank you for your very generous comments. Um, it's not often someone gets to hear their own eulogy, so I appreciate your, uh, the, all the nice things you had to say. And let me express my great admiration for, for Mitch Daniels and his leadership at Purdue and his leadership of our state and my gratitude for the Chief Justice for his years of service uh, that we spent together in the State House. And we were reminiscing earlier over lunch, our children back in the day when they were very young actually used to swim together up at the Riviera Club here in Indianapolis. So a lot of wonderful memories. I was gonna mention two other things. And uh, the first, uh, there's a statue of another governor uh, in front of the State House, and that's Oliver P. Morton. And it took a lot of courage and a lot of strength for him in collaboration with Abraham Lincoln uh, to keep Indiana's troops in the field uh, during the first couple years of the Civil War because we had a state legislature uh, that was dominated by Copperheads. The predominant uh, population centers at that time were in southern Indiana. There were a lot of southern sympathies there, and they were not amenable to approving the funds to keep the troops in the field. Uh, but Governor Morton and Abraham Lincoln uh, worked their way through that, and Indiana had one of the highest rates of um, fatalities of any state, if not the highest. And you can go to Grand Hill and other places and see the cost that our state paid to keep the union together, to end slavery. And I think that our state would have uh, been perceived much uh, differently if instead, during the Civil War, we had sort of opted out and had been neutral uh, rather than being firmly aligned with the cause of the North and, and Abraham Lincoln. And Governor Morton really took a strong hand in making that happen. But the other thing I was going to reference, and I think I may be right, it goes back to the original 1816 Constitution and was carried on, and that is we were one of the very first states to put in our foundational document uh, a commitment uh, for every child to receive a free public education. And that was really path-breaking because the common school movement <coughs> under Horace Mann and others really didn't gain steam until later in the 19th century, and so our state was one of the first now we can debate, I think there may be some questions later on about what we need to do to truly fulfill that commitment, particularly to uh, the third of the students who continue to struggle. But um, you know, I think it was just a marvelous expression of Hoosier values that from the very beginning of our state, we realized the importance of education, uh, not only to our economy, uh, but to our democracy and to the, the basic fabric of the state. And so I would uh, mention that decision. Uh, along with Governor Morton, and uh, that was actually Mitch on my list of what you mentioned as the, the three things that would uh, I'd mention. Well, and, and it creates a, an educated workforce just in time for the Industrial Revolution. And Indiana is, is primed; it's the second state to mandate attendance. I mean, it's one thing to have free public schools uh, wall to wall, which we managed to get done uh, uh, before the Civil War, actually, because of those provisions. Um, and quite another two. I'm going to mention two that, uh, two that are probably, I think, are on a smaller scale, but uh, are more, uh, more recent. One is a decision by the Indiana Supreme Court in the 1930s. Uh, uh, the court blinked on public debt. And uh, that is to say, it, 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 uh, at a moment when, uh, as I recall it, public housing was in serious uh, need, agreed that you could create these separate authorities and they could issue their own bonds, and that wasn't municipal debt. And the result of that was school cities and conservation districts and the whole has changed the character certainly of local government um, and, um, and I, I agree by the way very much with the two you've mentioned the third one uh, much more modern uh, i think even through the administrations of uh, uh, governor Whitkin and governor bowen that the state's role in local 
primary and secondary education was almost entirely financial. The question was, how much of it will we cover as a state? And when, when Bob Orr put the A-plus program down on the table, from that moment on, including over the weekend, governors and legislators decided that part of the decision making about what kind of education was needed, what was the minimum best, and how was it going to be organized, became both a local and a state decision, and that has uh, changed the dialogue uh, very dramatically. Well, let, let me ask, um, uh, then, uh, looking forward, um, uh, Evan, there was a lot of talk uh, uh, this year in, in our state about uh, infrastructure. What does Indiana need to do uh, to win or do, come, as, come as close to winning as we can in an international marketplace? What, what do you think are Indiana's most important infrastructure needs? Well, we are the crossroads of America, and so maintaining the quality of our highways and bridges is vitally important to our economy. Uh, we've got uh, some great uh, state port facilities that are important, uh, and airports. Uh, and I've always wished, Mitch, we could do a little bit more with that Gary Airport, uh, because that's just a jewel up there. I'd always hope that that could be to the Chicago area, what Newark has been to uh, the New York area. Amen. But um, uh, that's a longer conversation. But one thing I would mention is particularly for our smaller towns and rural areas, making sure that broadband is uh, available to all of our citizens, even in those kind of places. It's uh, vitally important to being economically uh, relevant, socially involved these days. And there's a real potential that we may see a, a, a sort of a reshoring of some kinds of employment to our smaller towns and rural areas, depending on the activity, but they gotta be connected to the web and they gotta be able to communicate and uh, exchange information and all the other things we do. And so I really think that we've got to focus on that in addition to the more traditional types of infrastructure so that those parts of our state just aren't cut off from the kind of vibrant future I think they can enjoy if they can be you know, technologically connected. Is that likely the best payoff of the ones you've listed, uh, ports, roads? Is the, is the internet connection maybe the best thing for the buck on that list or are there some others? I'd have to ask an economist about yeah. that. That'd be my guess. Uh, you catch less hell for it than you do at improving 37 South, for example. But uh, <laughs> I, I attended the IU game on Saturday. I happened to <coughs> notice that project. But in any event, um, probably. But you know, they're all, they're all important for different reasons. And we are a great distribution center still of physical goods. And so you've got to have physical infrastructure uh, to do that. Uh, but um, uh, you know, being uh, continuing the cutting edge technologically in the information economy, the innovation economy that we've got. I would put that at the top of my list. Mm -hmm. Mitch, I want to say the thank you to you. Every time I make the trip to my hometown, I, I sing your praises. It's a whole lot easier and, and uh, better. It's safer, faster. And it was all about you, Randy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, there, there are uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people who share my sense of gratitude. But what, what's, uh, what's, what does Indiana most need to, to prevail yeah. in the international? Well, I mean, Evan said it well. Um, we, we've got, uh, last I checked, uh, statistically faster broadband on average than most places, but there are pockets that don't, and it's a moving target. So absolutely, I think this is, belongs high on the list. Um, if you'd asked me first, I would have started with the Geary Airport in terms of, a, that was a frustration. I, I, I kept it, I still have it, list in my left-hand bottom drawer of mistakes and things we didn't get done. And that was always one that irritated me because, uh, it, it, just as Evan said, uh, this could be an economic driver, a significant driver for our northwest corner, and uh, it's been tangled up, uh, not for reasons of merit, but uh, provincial and political reasons uh, for a long time. And we've made some improvements there, but nothing that really brought it to its potential. Um, but also, let me say this about uh, the rest. Um, I've already said, I'm a Whig, I believe in this. Uh, this is a very central role of government. Uh, to make sure that the backbone of the economy, the infrastructure in all its forms is strong. And I'm not suggesting for a minute that we're, that we're, we're done, but 69 is built, and the High River Bridges are built, and 31 to South Bend is built, and the Hosier Heartland Corridor is built, and the Fort to Road from, from Fort Wayne to Toledo, and on and on. A third of the bridges in this state got rebuilt over the last 10 years, so we're not doing bad. CNBC rated Indiana as the number one infrastructure in the country. I don't know exactly what they're measuring, but... <laughs> If they're close, I like the answer. <laughs> so, uh, um, I guess I'd just say this when we try to look forward. We better make sure we're thinking about the economy that's coming and not the one that we're in or the one we've known. If the autonomous vehicle, just to take one example, 
happens as effectively and as fast as many people are now predicting. Um, we're not going to need as many uh, lane miles of highways because cars, vehicles are going to be moving much closer together than they do now. You may not need mass transit the way, in places where you thought you might because this may be a superior answer. So I think we better keep an eye on these fast emerging technologies and, and, and make our investment decisions accordingly. I mean, it, interestingly, Mitch, I was with a really smart person recently who, uh, in, in contrast opinion, to today, for instance, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there. actually a lot like today. <laughs> yeah. but, um, it was his opinion that uh, ten years from now, to your point, ten years from now, long haul over the road trucking yeah. will be a thing of the past. These will be self-driving trucks. Now they'll stop at distribution centers in close proximity to cities like uh, Indianapolis. Uh, but just think about that. I'm sure they'll be more efficient, more cost-effective, more productive. But just think about that, how that's going to dislocate that part of the labor market. And he thought that was within a decade. So uh, we do have that. One, Will they still take a very long time to pass one another so that we can't? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in favor of the that. autonomous vehicle arriving one day after they take my driver's license. Until <laughs> <laughs> then, I'm not too happy about the idea. I'll tell you, there's one story about uh, a major infrastructure project that might have happened. It wasn't the Gary Airport. I don't know if I've ever told you this, Mitch, but we had a, an agreement with the state of Illinois. Jim Edgar was governor, good Republican, and the mayor of Chicago, uh, Mayor Daley in those days, to build a new bi-state airport. It was going to be half in Indiana, half in Illinois. The beauty of the thing was Chicago was going to pay for it all. We had no money in the deal. Off their passenger fees off of O'Hare and Midway, they were desperate to expand. They couldn't get more runways at uh, O'Hare, and so they agreed to this deal. And every, we had a, an announcement up there. It was beautiful. And, and you'll like this, too. They did some study in uh, Illinois before we agreed to the deal, wanted to have a tax equalization zone in a 50-mile circumference around the airport because they knew the differential on tax rates, and so they kind of figured out where the first wave of development would take place. <laughs> One going to be in Illinois. So not having been born yesterday, we didn't agree to that. But in any event, where I'm going with the story is, so we have to we make this big announcement. It's going to be billions of dollars of infrastructure investment. Unfortunately for us, the flight path uh, on the new airport went right over the district of the uh, president pro tem of the Illinois State Senate, a guy named Pate Phillip. He literally, he literally went in to see Governor Edgar and said, Jim, you can have a state budget, or you can have an airport, but you can't have both. <laughs> Naturally, the governor chose the budget, so that was the end of that. But that, that might have revolutionized things up there. One of the things that's going to be revolutionized is uh, one of our classic advantages, uh, the low cost of energy. Um, uh, our reliance on coal has been a problem and a blessing both. Uh, but that's going to shift. Uh, Mitch, and what, how, where is that, what's that shift going to mean to us uh, as the nation and perforce Indiana move into yeah. uh, solar and gas? And, uh, well, it's one of the perversities, I thought, of the last 15 or 20 years that uh, sitting on a lot of coal, Indiana was always spending a billion dollars plus to import it from somewhere else due to the characteristics of the coal and so forth. And we had a very conscious pro uh, policy to try to find clean ways to use it. I always said, let's pay ourselves, pay Hoosiers for it, as I'm tired of paying people in Wyoming or somewhere. So that's what led to, uh, you know, uh, an electrical plant with sequestration uh, possibilities uh, for the CO2. That's what led to the attempt to build a coal to gas plant, which was uh, eventually undone, really, by the revolution in natural gas. And one of these days, I still can imagine a coal to liquids plant here and produce fuels, all these ways to use the energy we were given uh, in, in environmentally uh, acceptable ways. Um, but the, but the, uh, the, the shale gas breakthroughs are just spectacular. I mean, set Indiana aside for a minute, as a nation, this is the single highest card our, our economy's been dealt in this century anyway, and I hope we maximize the possibilities. From an Indiana standpoint, um, uh, as, as a manufacturing state, energy, affordable, reliable energy, and in particular, or in specific, natural gas in many, many cases, is an incredibly important uh, advantage. And so uh, I look forward to buttress our manufacturing, uh, much of our manufacturing base, in the, at least in the intermediate term, while it replaces coal in, uh, 
in, uh, in less carbon intensive ways uh, that uh, allows us, I hope, to maintain our advantage, the advantage all Hoosiers share as, as individual rate payers or as employees in, uh, in uh, some of the nation's uh, lower, lowest cost energy. It's as much an international uh, question as it is a local. You know, I think we ought to use all the Indiana coal we can. Uh, I agree with Mitch that th this has been one of the most transformative technological in, uh, developments of the last you know, half century, the, the ability to extract large quantities of natural gas and oil from places that previously we couldn't have. And so it's driven down the price of natural gas, which is great for consumers, it's great for manufacturing. I think you'll see a lot of reshoring uh, back to the United States, particularly in the petrochemical area, plastics, things that tend to use a lot of uh, natural gas. There may be some opportunities for us in those arenas, and there's also a huge um, geopolitical issue here. I hope we can maybe use this as an opportunity to help wean the Western Europeans off of Russian gas where they're so dependent right now. And the, the last thing, Randy, I'll say, I've been around long enough. I was um, sitting on the banking committee when Alan Greenspan came in to testify, and at that point he said one of the most important things we could do for the U.S. economy was to construct terminals on our coasts for the importation, importation of liquefied natural gas. We're now in the process of constructing those terminals, but it's to export yeah. liquefied natural gas. And that's changed in 15 years. And it's just amazing, breathtaking, how quickly that's changed. One last factoid. There was not a new fertilizer plant built in the United States for 25 years. And when this development happened, investors from all over the world began looking here. We licensed the first one down on the Ohio River, the Indiana had seen in forever, and the second one is seeking, I, last I checked, still seeking the necessary permits to move forward. And, and uh, this, this is a high value added manufacturing with some good jobs attached. Well, speaking of value added, um, uh, uh, the, the question of how we create uh, a workforce that is capable of grabbing all these opportunities is uh, got to be close to the top of the list. Mitch, what, what, is, what does Indiana need to do to create people who are both good citizens and uh, talented for the next, uh, next economy? The, the answer to so many questions starts with a better K-12 system, so I'll just say that and leave it there. <laughs> but it can't be, you can't address this or a lot of other important issues I can mention without starting there. So, um, but past that, we have three quarters of a million Hoosiers who did some, who got some post-secondary education and never finished a credential or certificate. And uh, nobody's found the right answer yet. But we've got that, there's a there's a there's some low fruit and some real upside possibilities that I hope we can seize. Uh, more and more people are recognizing that a bachelor's degree from a four-year school. I'm happy to. See, I'm happy to be part of one that produces those, an institution that produces those, but there are, as we all know now, I think, a large number of skilled jobs that pay very well going begging in this state and in this country. And they have, they have nothing to do, really, with a, let's say, a you know, Purdue four-year uh, or more degree. And so uh, getting serious about that in the way that I know Ivy Tech is uh, now is, uh, is another real good possibility. Um, but let me just... Uh, point out that there, there, there's another way that people I always overlook. You know, for the last three or four years, Indiana has uh, taken in, we've had a net in-migration of college graduates. So everybody in the room either has experienced or seen close hand that talented young person who got a good education and went somewhere else, at least temporarily. A lot of them come back. But uh, we all have, and, I, first among them, am worried about that, and we should. Uh, but um, what we've noticed less is that this worm has turned somewhat, and there's a lot, you know, another way to have more college graduates is to import them. And some of the great businesses that are growing around central Indiana and other places are bringing college graduates who started life somewhere else into the state. The margin's not big yet, but if we can sustain that over time, it'll start to address this problem. So there, that's another way to skin the cat. I want to uh, uh, take you back right to your very beginning, though. At the moment, at, at least in the public press, the big discussion is how to finance pre-K, uh, and it, 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 and not how do we.
finish up all those degrees that are unfinished and how do we expand higher education? Uh, it, uh, I, I guess one would be loath to say one's more important than the other, but it seems to me the public dialogue hasn't recognized the higher ed needs um, in, in quite the way that we've uh, got this easy to understand project that will have value but, uh, but, but isn't at the end of the road. Uh, you got to get a view on that? You're, you're, you're in favor of higher ed or both? I do think we have to explore um, uh, even doing even more earlier in life. Uh, ours was the administration that, that made uh, full day kindergarten universal in Indiana, something that Evan had worked on and his successor, and it took a long, took a while to get there. So, and I'm convinced that was a big step forward that some, <coughs> some folks have uh, uh, quickly forgotten. Um, you know, the evidence is mixed on pre-K, but I do believe it's worth a, a, a try, certainly if it's done surgically and, uh, and uh, in, a, in a targeted fashion. Um, it just has to be said that fundamental problems for too many of our young people are cultural. It, it, you can't blame this on the education system. It has its defects. But when far too many uh, children are coming from households where education is not reinforced, is not revered, when nobody's checking the homework, when nobody's reading to them when they're two and three and four years old, um, you've got a problem. I don't think pre-K really can fix it, but it can help if it's done well and there's evidence that in some places uh, brought to the right children, it can, it can help. And so I do believe we're obliged to try. Yeah, for, for the, I agree with what Mitch just said about, for, I think it needs to start earlier. I'm a proponent of more pre-K. It's got to be voluntary for children that age. You can't you know, mandate what families are doing, but making that opportunity available for those who want to avail themselves for it, I think does pay dividends over time. Uh, you know, it's amazing the percentage of kids who show up in you now kindergarten, or it used to be first grade, developmentally, you know, a year or two behind. They can catch up, many of them do, but it's just a lot harder. You're going to spend a lot of money on remedial activities, uh, but a lot of that is uh, cultural, uh, unfortunately. You know, back in the day, when I was deeply involved in education policy, and I would bet it's still the same, the two most accurate predictors of academic success, quality of the classroom professional, parental involvement, and in fact, that might be reversed. You know, does, does at least one parent care and is paying attention and communicating to that child that going to school, that learning is important, the kids pick up on that. And when, when uh, Susan was our first lady, she made, uh, started a non-for-profit to deal with uh, illiteracy and found that illiteracy ran in families, not because it was hereditary or genetic, that's not the case, but because uh, if mom and dad didn't read, well then there was no newspaper, no periodical, then the children were less likely to read. So a lot of it does come back to um, some cultural and family changes and uh, we've got to get the parents involved uh, if we're going to make real progress in this. I want to ask uh, one more topic, and then I'll uh, will uh, happily. David Johnson has sorted out some great questions from our audience. Uh, uh, Evan, it, it's been an article of faith. Maybe it lasts all the way back to the internal improvements experience that uh, a key to Indiana is low taxes. Um, most of the things that are on our plate now, we now have the lowest income tax rate that we've had in a long time. We've got very, surprising to me, very high um, sales tax rate. But is, is, are, can we, is there a way to do some of these initiatives uh, and still, uh, still um, keep that idea of that low tax is the most important thing? It's, it's uh, um, you'd always hope you could, but I wonder whether there's really enough revenue on the table is what I'm just asking. Well, now that I won't be running for office again, I can tell you what I really think. <laughs> uh, you know, look, I've always been um, a little more conservative on these kind of things for um, a couple of reasons. Number one, I think freedom's a good thing. And the more we can allow our citizens to enjoy the fruits of your labors and to keep as much of your money as you've earned as possible, I, I, think, that's a, I think that's a good thing. Uh, number two, I think in general, uh, free markets tend to be uh, better allocators, efficient allocators of capital uh, than large government bureaucracies. Uh, but there are some things that uh, the markets don't do. We were talking about public infrastructure is one. Making sure that every family has access to affordable education may be another. 
And so the question then is, you know, at the margins, Randy, for those, you know, for me, if I, you know, my first question, uh, whenever someone would come to me and uh, propose raising revenue, was always, okay, what are we going to do with it? And what, what is the return on that going to be? And there better be a way of accountability to make sure we're actually getting the benefits that you're proposing. Otherwise, folks will just think we're taking their money and they're not getting anything for it. So my answer would be, sure, from time to time you need money to do things like have great universities or public infrastructure or affordable, you know, uh, and high quality public education system. But you've got to have a system of, of accountability. Um, otherwise, you run the risk of lose, not only getting the results that you want, but losing the faith of the public uh, that's necessary to, uh, to achieve that in the first place. So that's a long way of saying, what's the benefit, what's the rate of return if you're going to raise money on that investment you're going to make, and how are you going to hold people accountable for actually achieving it? That's really good. I used to say that to my liberal friends all the time. Yeah. I said, you want more money? Well, you better prove to people it's going to be worthwhile. And you know, that's really the, the They challenge. rarely believe you, but you really meant it, didn't they? <laughs> I did. Yeah. You know? Uh, well, I can tell you some stories about that, yeah, too. That. So uh, my nickname when I was governor, at least for part of my party, Mitch Davis, used to call me Ebenezer. And I was <laughs> like, like, me, like me, careful with the money. Mitch, how does our attitude about taxation affect our ability to get things done? Well, there's more than one way to raise more revenue. Mm -hmm. You want to do big things, you need revenue. But there's, there are ways, and uh, the single best way, the most productive way, is to have a growing economy with more. I always used to say we don't need higher tax rates, we need more taxpayers. More people making more money. And um, uh, not always, but in, in most cases, um, the, uh, an approach like Evan just outlined is more conducive to the economic growth and therefore the natural organic growth of revenues that does give government the opportunity to do the things that, that it ought to do. Um, you know, I can name a lot of states, uh, one to our immediate west and a couple on the coast who wish they had um, a, a more of an aversion to higher taxes because they're caught in what may be death spirals. You know, more people left California in the last two or three years than moved in. That's never happened in the history of America. You know, um, uh, they've got themselves in a situation, you've read about this, where literally one or two percent of all the taxpayers are paying a majority of the certainly the income taxes, and that's, that's a formula for, uh, for, for failure. So, um, you know, this uh, properly constructed, if you, I once proposed a, a temporary surtax for a very specific purpose, to eliminate the debt the state had. We couldn't make that happen, fine, we found another way to do it, took, took a little longer, but yes, for a specific worthy purpose, I think, I think people can support it, but, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in a, there's some good work that uh, Matt Wilde at the University of Indianapolis has done recently, illuminates something I always knew was true. The standard of living in this state is well above the national average. The only reason that people misrepresent this is they haven't noticed how low the cost of living is here and how low the taxes are. So your standard of living is determined by how much money is left in your pocket and what it'll buy. And we're about 20th on the way up. So we want to be pretty careful, I think, jeopardizing what is now one of the most attractive business climates in the country, a fiscal situation which Evan contributed to protecting and which some of the rest of us did, which says to individuals and says to businesses, you come to Indiana, you are very unlikely to get a rude surprise and some sort of terrible collapse of services or a big jump in your taxes. I think it's been a secret to some progress we've made and we just want to... Um, there can be exceptions, but in general, I think that policy serves as well. One of our, uh, uh, our questions I, is... I, I just yeah, mention one quick thing, Ray. I, I think the chances of there being comprehensive corporate tax reform are really pretty good mm -hmm. under the new president and with the new Congress, and that there's a chance that they'll uh, really rework the individual side of the code as well. The reason I mention that, Mitch, I think what uh, Governor Daniels said will be even more so if, if you look at the, the Treasury Secretary-designate uh, said that uh, they're going to eliminate a lot of the deductions and preferences in the code. And if they eliminate the deduction for uh, state and local taxes, mm -hmm. well, then some of these places like New York and California, where the, the citizens there go, well, yeah, I'm paying a lot more, but I can deduct it off my federal return, so the hit's not quite so bad. Suddenly, they're not going to be able to do that anymore. Which translates into those, those uh, suckers out in Indiana are subsidizing me. Well, uh, yeah. 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 It, 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 right. Anyway, successful people in those places may be leaving in droves at that point. <laughs> be awfully happy to, uh, as we might say, become Hoosiers by choice. 
Well, one of our uh, audience members has a, uh, speaking of, of uh, finance, an idea uh, that um, uh, I'd never, I'd never contemplated, Mo monetizing assets, which is what the major moves amounted to and what the Pence administration's uh, tra proposed transaction on the cell towers has to do with. And the proposal is, why not sell the Hoosier lottery or, or lease it for 50 years? Uh, is, is that, is, are, there, is, are there other assets like that? I mean, that would, well, that would produce that. a huge amount of money. I, I, we proposed that, that, actually, yeah. although not quite, not, not the whole um, enchilada. Uh -huh. um, we proposed, uh, on the heels of major moves, we asked exactly that question. I think this is a, a very plausible thing. Some will recall, we proposed not monetizing, not, not leasing the entire proceeds of the lottery. We said Indiana will, will continue to receive then just over $200 million it's gotten, but we'll freeze it there. And we will, who wants to bid for the growth over time? And we, uh, we were able to value it at over a billion dollars. This is 2007, I guess. But uh, the legislature did not agree, so it didn't happen. It was all to be invested in higher education, by the way. So I tried it twice, two different ways. You know the thing that uh, has gotten a lot of publicity down in Tennessee, um, where every, they've offered everybody, uh, at least up to a certain income level, a couple years at the community college? Mm. That's our idea. Mm. We even called it. We even had the same label of the Hoosier Promise Board. And that's how we were going to we were going to endow it mm. with the proceeds. So, um, you know, uh, it, this in any such question would be approached should be approached just the way every business person in the audience would. If you've got an asset that uh, you think so, uh, that uh, uh, is not performing as well as you think it could, and someone else thinks they could earn a higher return on it, um, absolutely, you should consider. Uh, converting that asset with one critical proviso. The proceeds have got to be reinvested in another long-term asset. You can't, you can't be using them to pay operational costs. You can't take tomorrow's revenue and pull it forward to today. And as long as you're doing that, as long as you're reinvesting it in something, higher education, I-6931, et cetera, et cetera, that you think will bring a, a bigger return or a better uh, a public return over time, then absolutely you should look at it. You know any law firms that can help facilitate an arrangement <laughs> like this? Uh, ah, uh, I'm not in that business. I want to keep, your, uh, keep your eyes out. Um, uh, let's, let me start on another question unless you want to add to that uh, uh, in some way. Um, uh, one of our uh, 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 friends in the audience says uh, in, a, in a federal environment where the claim is, or the plan is, to roll back a number of existing regulations that seem to affect the business climate. Are, are there some of those that would be, make more difference in Indiana of the list that, you, that you've seen? Well, I think some of the environmental ones uh, would make a bigger difference. The Clean Power Plan, for example, there are some things that would uh, threaten to drive up the cost for you know, Hoosier utilities, ratepayers, businesses. So uh, I think a number of those rules and regulations will be, um, will be walked back. Uh, the Dodd-Frank uh, legislation, uh, some of that will be uh, unwound. And that'll have an impact on our state, but not as much as some of the places where the big uh, money center banks are headquartered and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I've already mentioned you know, taxes, but that's gonna be legislative, not, uh, not regulatory. But then obviously the big one also would be um, the Affordable Care Act. And uh, that will be repealed. And the question is, you know, how long they will allow a grace period for a replacement. There are some, and Mitch might know more about this than I do, but there are some within the Republican Party who are advocating for a very quick replacement. Others who will say, no, no, this is going to take some time. And if you move very quickly, you run the risk of destabilizing the insurance markets uh, in the, um, particularly in the individual sector of the insurance, the health insurance market, which is about 12% of Americans. And finally, you know, the Senator, or not Senator, Governor Pence did make with some, I thought, uh, thoughtful adjustments to the decision to participate in the Medicaid expansion, which uh, for those of you in the uh, audience, and I do know some who are in the, uh, on the provider side of things, this helped to deal with the problem of uninsured, who then the cost for caring for them get passed on to others, driving up the cost of insurance for everybody else. Uh, you know, is that repealed? Uh, it would be as a part of the, if they just have a flat out repeal, or is that grandfathered in? Uh, again, that's legislatively, but there will be 
a lot of regulatory decisions too on the uh, on the healthcare front that will impact our state. But I think so. It would be mostly legislatively when the Affordable Care Act is repealed. What is it replaced with, if anything? Uh, but mostly, I just, uh, that's a long uh, free association way of saying probably energy, Randy. Yeah. Want to add to that? I'll just say this: the uh, I don't know which path they'll take forward on the Affordable Care Act. It's imploding, and they're going to have to do something. Even it's uh, most of its original advocates uh, agree with that. Um, but uh, there's every chance that uh, uh, an Indiana-born program will um, soon be national in some form. Um, as, as Evan pointed out, most of, by far, most of the uh, newly covered people under the Affordable Care Act are in Medicaid, which isn't necessarily a good thing because it's, it's provably the worst health care in America. In Oregon, they did, a, they did a, a study a few years ago and found out that people on Medicaid had worse health outcomes than people who had no insurance at all. So, uh, but that's where most of the, whatever it is, 11 million net new coverees are. Now, um, I think there's a high, whatever they do, the Affordable Care Act it, um, and its uh, exchanges and its penalties and its subsidies and its mandates and all that, um, I think there's a high possibility uh, that something that governors and both parties have asked for for a long time, which is free our hands on Medicaid, is going to happen. And uh, I think there's every chance that the uh, outlines of the Healthy Indiana Plan of, of a few years ago, which is the basis of the Medicaid expansion that Evan mentioned uh, here uh, might, uh, might be applied nationally because it's, uh, it's always attracted a lot of attention and some uh, supporters and, uh, and uh, actually a very talented woman who was uh, certainly one of our uh, important uh, uh, mechanics in putting the thing together years ago is now the head of CMS, the agency that runs Medicare and Medicaid. So, Maybe we'll have an export of, a, of an Indiana idea. Let's see. Well, we've come to the end of the hour, but um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that one of the questions we won't have time to answer, but has a wonderful sentiment embedded in it. Uh, how do we keep our momentum for growing Indiana? Uh, a question that came in that uh, um, poses a lot of questions, but also suggests uh, a recognition that uh, uh, we're in good times and. Uh, have the potential for, uh, for better. Um, uh, thanks to both of you. Thanks for giving us the chance to muse on these questions, uh, members of the Economic Club. Gentlemen, thank you. That is the fastest 50 minutes I think any of us have ever had at one of these luncheons. That was just terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, this presentation will be broadcast on WFYI Public Radio 90.1 FM uh, on Saturday, January 14th. It will also be available for download at WFYI.org. Please join us next month on Tuesday, January 24th, as we welcome keynote speaker Bill Hansen, who's the president and CEO of USA Funds. Information and tickets for each of the season's presenters can be found on our website at the Economic Club of Indiana.com. Have a terrific holiday season. This is a great send-off for it. We look forward to seeing you in the new year. Thank you.